Right. Because my rant and raving isn't going to hurt them a bit. They're going to go, I not only kicked you in the head, but I got you so upset, you're no good for anything now. And so it's better to, God says, to just forgive them that despitefully use it. Bless them that despitefully use it. Yeah. Okay? And so, however we use whatever gifts God has given us, then we're to use them in the light of waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Then he addressed the security. Number three, security, verses eight and nine. Paul now addresses God's guarantee to the Corinthians and, by extension, to all Christians everywhere. Read verse two. Unto the church of God, which is in at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And so, obviously, we can apply the next things that God says. I was in chapter 1, verse 2, showing that we apply it to, although God had Paul write this to the Corinthians, it's applicable to all of us. And so, security. A. They are confirmed in Jesus Christ, verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so who shall also confirm you? Am I going too fast? Yeah. Okay, I was going to say I can slow down if you want. Here you're seeing God. You're going. I'm on page 6. Yeah. 3A. In verse 8, he says that they will be confirmed. Who shall also confirm you unto the end? Baba Yosef. It means to confirm or to firmly establish. In Christ, they are firmly, firmly established unto the end, specifically referring to Christ's second coming to get his saints. B. This confirmation in Christ is God's guarantee that they will be held blameless in that day. So the second part of verse 8 says, that you may be saved? No. Verse 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless oh. in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blameless. Blameless. That's why when you, now that you have the book, you take it home and yes. study ahead of what the ways, fill in the scriptures. An eglatos. An eglatos. It means not arraigned. Can anybody tell me in here what an arraignment is? Like arraignment in the court. <laughs> in the court. Yeah. It's a legal term. Yeah. yeah. Pay it, preparing to see what they got. Yeah. When you're arraigned, they tell you exactly what you're guilty of or what you're not guilty of. Yeah, like evidence. Exactly what you're accused of. That's an arraignment. It's not the trial. Right. It's ahead of time so that you know what you're being blamed for. Yes. You're not guilty until the trial. Right. And so here, when he says that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord, it means not only were you found not guilty, you can't even be arraigned. Yes. You can't. God's not going to stand there and say, well, you did this sin while you were there. That's your arraignment. Then the judgment would come of being cast into hell. Not only can we not be cast into hell, we're not even going to be arraigned. He's not even going to say, you did this. This is what you're accused of. And now I'm going to show you that you did what you were accused of. So not only is our trial gone, our arraignment's gone in Christ. So they will be held Amen. blameless, Amen. not arraignable, unarraigned, all right? Not only will the Corinthians and saints everywhere be found not guilty in that day, that would be the trial, but they will be found unblameable, irreproachable, and in fact, unaccusable. Mm. We can't even be accused. Why? Well, because Christ was already arraigned, accused, right. and sentenced, and executed for us. Right. It's all gone. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we will observe when others are judged out of the book of their works. But we're not going to be part of that judgment. Our judgment was already in Christ. There you go. Okay? Thank you. And now, all right, letter C at the bottom of that page for me. I hope it is for you. The ground of their security. Mm -hmm. Chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, 
God is, back in the textbook, under B, God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son. The very ground of their security is in the unchanging faithfulness of the eternal God. Even if we're unfaithful, he's still faithful. Yes, he is. And when we're unfaithful, can we lose our salvation? No. No, because it says we're not only, not only is our trial already taken place, we're not even arraignable anymore. When we're unfaithful, he remains faithful. I love the way God does it all through the Bible. Yes. Our security does not depend on us. Yeah. Our security depends on the faithfulness of God, and God cannot be unfaithful. God is faithful. Mm -hmm. And that's what it says in the first part of verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son. Mm -hmm. And so our security doesn't rest with us. It's a good thing because yeah. we'd lose it all. Yeah. We would. First time, not only the first time we did something wrong, the first time we thought something wrong. Mm. I've preached this and taught this I don't know how many times. Grace. Yep. Under law, you had to do it. Grace is harder. Because under grace, you can't even think it. Mm. Yeah. Thought will cross your mind. That's not what I'm talking about. That's just the devil shooting darts into your mind. Wow. It's when you start contemplating on that particular sin and doing that particular thing. I was watching that because every time the air conditioner comes on, that goes blank. I just oh. want to make sure we were still streaming. All right. It's just the uh, monitors go off. Why do we have an air conditioner on? Uh, they must have turned it back on because I turned it on today. I mean, I turned it off today. So they must have turned it on in there this evening. Okay, so God says that under grace, we can't, if a man looketh on a woman, to lust after her. That's just not a passing glance. That's looking on her like a dog chasing a female dog. That's the natural man. But the spiritual man is going to say, like I think I said this Sunday, yep, God, you did a good job on that one. Now I think I'll go home and say hi to my wife. Yeah. You know, you can't help the first look, but you can sure help the second one. Yeah. See how that's blinking? Yeah. It just made the monitor go dark again. It's back on. Okay, so if we had just a bad thought where we're contemplating on something, not just a passing thought, then we would lose it. That's why it does not rest in our faithfulness. It rests in God's faithfulness. God says you accept Christ. These things are yours. The security of the believer, you've you're already been arraigned, judged, and executed in Christ. It's all gone. Okay. Um, I had that extra page there, so we need to put that under here. There we go. Okay. Faithfulness is not just something that God exhibits in expression toward the Corinthians and by application to us. Top it of is page seven. top of page seven. There you go. Um, it may be on the bottom of theirs where it says faithfulness is not just something that God exhibits in expression toward the Corinthians. It is bound in the very essence of God. In fact, his name is faithful. Read, uh, Daniel, would you read Revelation 19, 11 for me? Sure, certainly. Not some of my pages of six. Because one of them was incomplete, so I gave you an extra copy. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wanted you to have all of the work. Why do I get the extra stuff? Everybody did. Oh, okay. Yep. No, I didn't see it. No, fair enough. Yep. Revelation 19.11. Thank you. Daniel? Revelation 19.11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Wow. And in righteousness that he judge and make war. Okay, so his name is faithful and true. So that very essence of God, that's where faithfulness resides. It's not just something God shows towards us. It's what he is. Mm. Okay. Uh, D. The results of this security is fellowship. We read that in verse 9. All right. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The fellowship is with Christ, true, but it is even more than that. It is the fellowship of Christ. 
not just fellowship with Christ. This fellowship denotes a group, and this group consists of Christ and all those that are his. That's all Christians. Mm. A complete explanation of this fellowship can be found in 1 John 1, 3. Would you read that, Brother Robert? 1 John 1, 3. We'll wait on you. 1 John 1, 3. Yeah. Bigger print, easier to read. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so the fellowship that's being talked Amen. about in Corinthians isn't just fellowship with Christ. It's fellowship with the Son, it's with the Father, and our fellowship. We're all one big group. So that means people of other churches too. Yeah. And people of churches that maybe are of the charismatic bent. Because as you go through First Corinthians, you're going to find out it was a totally charismatic church. Mm. But it was still called the Church mm. of God, verse 1. Paul taught, uh, verse 2, unto the Church of God, which is at Corinth. They were misusing tongues. They were misusing the word of truth, the word of knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so... Uh, our fellowship is with anyone that has accepted Christ as their Savior. Now, if I'm going to sit down with them and have a Bible study, that's a little different story. But we have fellowship with all Christians everywhere. Yes. Because our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Okay. D. Uh, I, already, I already read that. Number four. Back in the textbook. Number four. Okay. Then he makes a transition in... 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This reference to the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, that's the two blanks in the textbook. Jesus Christ our Lord is an obvious transition into the next section of the letter where Paul addresses the Christian party politics with their lines drawn along both ethnicity and brains engaged in by the Corinthians. These were issues that were causing divisions in the church. Paul would address and expand on these most pressing of problems until climaxing his arguments and closing the subject in the last few verses of chapter 3. Paul received a letter from someone who had been at Corinth. And they told him, these people are all split and Four different groups. I'm of Paul, I'm, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Jesus. They then asked him to address some other problems, such as sexual immorality. But he didn't go there first. He went to the spiritual problems, the inner problems. These are easy to, to rectify. Yep. Stop doing it. How do you quit smoking? I tell people this all the time. I wish I could figure out how to quit smoking. Don't stick a cigarette in your mouth. Well, look, it's not easy. I didn't say it was easy. I said it was simple. How do you not drink? Well, don't pick up a bottle. And put... See, the physicals, eat, not easy. Simple to get rid of. Yeah. Just don't do it. But the ones in here are hard. Yeah, they are. Yeah, those are the ones that are hard. Because iniquity begins in the heart and exhibits itself as sin in the members yes. out here. So it starts here, and then it works out to here. That's why in counseling, when you take the counseling class, which you will probably maybe next year or the following year, when you counsel someone, I'm going to have to just real quick do this. All right? What's that noise? That's the clock. Okay, this is an onion. What's the hardest part? Hardest? Hottest? part of that onion. The heart. The heart. This is counsel. Yeah. People come in and tell you about all this. Right. No. Those are symptoms of this problem. So then you counsel them and they stop smoking. All right. They, they stop smoking. And then you got down to here, but they're still drinking. That's just a symptom. Okay, mm. so then you get you work on that symptom, and you keep working on the symptoms until you get down to the heart of the matter, 
which is sin and rebellion against God. It may not be your sin. It might be someone else's sin against you. But that's still the root of your problem. You're still carrying Now, it. your problem here is unforgiveness. Oh. Because so, if you don't forgive them, are you hurting them any? No. They're going, hey, man, I not only, I not only hurt you physically, yeah. but I hurt you in your, emotionally and in your mind, et cetera, et cetera. That's your pride. Okay. I heard, Dr. I heard of forgiveness. That's your pride of. As taking poison and hoping the other person dies. That's right. Taking poison what? yourself and hoping the other person dies. Okay. So. Because uh, I stopped smoking, I seen it in my face. They take the poison. Oh, oh. In the yeah. hospital? They take the poison. They take two and three o'clock in the morning. Then they, they, it's it's going to do more harm, though. One at a, one oh, at no, a no, time. No. One at a time. Okay. And they did what now? I said. It helped me to stop smoking when I seen when I was working in the hospital and we woke them up two or three o'clock in the morning for their breathing treatments and they were yellow and gray and emphysema, and cancer, and, everything. And stuff was coming out of the mouth. Yeah, I was just like, no. Yeah. That's why when I was growing up, you know what they would do to kids that were starting to become juvenile delinquents? They'd take them down to the jail. Hmm. And let them walk through the jail and look at the guys that were in there. Mm. Yeah, they won't do that anymore. That's violating their their civil rights or whatever. Uh, if you got a kid that's smoking, take him in the cancer ward and let him listen to somebody that's choking to death on their own fluids from cancer. My son, I was taking a bath one time. My son came in, and I pulled the curtain. You know, drinking a cup of tea, taking a bath, and he was throwing up in the toilet. I pulled the curtain back. I said, you've been smoking, haven't you? He said, yes. I said, good. I hope you puke out your toenails. Yeah. And pulled the curtain back. <laughs> I mean, he did it to himself. I wasn't going to feel sorry for him. Right. But anyway, so here are the pressing problems that the Corinthians thought they had. Words was not their biggest problem. They wanted him to help them with the outer problems. Paul went right to the heart of the matter. He said, your problem is you can't even agree who's what and what's going on. Mm. You're divided into four different groups, and group one won't speak to groups two, three, and four. Group two won't speak to one, three, and four. Three won't speak to one, two, and four. And four won't speak to one, two, and three, and probably doesn't even speak to all their own. They were all fractured into th at least four different factions. That's where Paul went first. Mm. Divisions in the church are the biggest problem in the church. Once the church comes in unity, then they're going to be able to take care of any physical sin that's in the church. But if the church isn't unified, one group's going to beat the guy up, the other group's going to kick him in the head, another group might forgive him, but then the fourth group is liable to just throw him away. They're no good anymore. Get rid of them. Now, if the church is unified, then they would go by the scriptures, which said, if you see a brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, Kick him in the head. No. 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 It says, no, restore no. such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, yes. lest thou also be tempted. So if I kick you in the head while you're down, God says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the next time the devil sends somebody around, and God will probably tell the devil to. What did he tell Job? What did he tell the devil? I mean, what did he tell the devil about Job? He said, go ahead, but you can only go this far. So if I kick you in the head, then God's going to tell the devil to send one of his demons around and start kicking me in the head. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, God, help me. God, help me. Well, you wouldn't help your brother. Yeah. I'm going to let you suffer a little bit of consequences. I'm not going to let you die. Remember, God told the devil, Job, you couldn't, kid, couldn't take his life. You could take his family. You could take his riches. You could take his health. But you can't kill him. Right. And so God will let me suffer the consequences. Let me get kicked in the head so that the next time one of you is down, I'm probably a lot less likely to kick you in the head. Right. All right. And so that kind of division means they're not even following the scriptures. So how are you going to take care of sin in the church, physical sin, if you've got a church that won't follow the scriptures? Okay, a plea for unity. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 17, and we'll take them one verse at a time. Division is the biggest problem in the church. It is bigger than fleshly sins, thus it is addressed first by Paul. 
chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So that means in the divisions, they weren't of the same mind. This group wanted to do this, that group wanted to do that. This group. I've had pastors, half a dozen pastors tell me they know churches that split over the color of carpet on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. We need new carpet, so they took up a big offering. Well, this group wanted blue, and this group wanted that. Uh, it's not purple, but it's like a, a wine color, you know. So one group, in maroon, thank you. One group would want the maroon, the other would want blue. We all put our money in there, so we got a right to say what it is. That's not uh, unity. That's uh, not uh, unity. Not at all. And, and uh, uh, other things, I know people that have left churches, have you ever heard of Junk for Jesus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Junk for Jesus? Mm -hmm. Somebody buys a brand new vacuum, and they got an old one that keeps eating the belts about every five times they vacuum the floor. So they buy a new one and they give the junk to Jesus. Yeah. My daddy and the Lord was up in the Seattle, North Seattle area, and uh, I think it was no, it wasn't him. It was brother. I think it was brother Prisk. Anyway, he said this guy brought a big picture of a long-haired Jesus in a dress. Mm. I mean, that's what it looks like, you know, with a frilly collar, the droopy eye, you know, feminine face, long hair, and uh, the guy brought it in, and he, because he got some new pictures for his wallet at home, brought it in and said, here, I want you to put that up in the church. Mm. And the preacher took it and gave it to one of his deacons and said, file that for me, will you? Yeah. We'll talk about it later. Well, the problem was the file was the garbage can. Exactly. Really well and so the guy walked out the door, walked to the garbage can, but the preacher didn't realize the garbage can was outside the window. Mm. And so the guy that gave the picture saw them doing that. Mm. Another preacher told me about a guy that uh, owned a theater and he spent thousands of dollars getting new curtains you know the big curtains yeah because they needed some for in front of the baptistry and all that kind of stuff and he got the new ones because the old ones were moldy mm. he, well, he gave the old ones to the church uh -huh. and you couldn't even put it up because it stunk of mold uh -huh. and the guy got mad because the preacher wouldn't put it up in the building uh -huh. divisions those kind of problems split churches over the color of the carpet, the color of the paint on the walls. Paul said, no, you need to be of one mind. That's what he said there. The same mind and the same judgment, uh, there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Mm -hmm. Later on, when he addresses the sexual sins, uh -huh. half the people in the church was oh no that's wrong and the other half said oh well after they're all they're only human i mean they're not and paul said isn't there somebody among you that can judge whether this is right or wrong he said i'm not even there and i can judge that this is wrong don't you have he said why don't you take the least among you and put them judge because he was saying that dumbest least bottom of the barrel guy he probably knows it's wrong you want to find out if drinking's wrong Go downtown Salt Lake and find some drunk puking in his shoes sitting on the curb. Yeah. And ask him, is that a good thing that you got drunk today? Yeah. Now, he's going to do it again tomorrow because the yeah. Bible says a dog will return to his vomit. All right? But at the time he's throwing up, he's going to say, no, I'll never do this again. This... So ask the least among them because they know. They can't wait till tomorrow. Oh, yeah, and tomorrow. They get... That's what it says in Proverbs. I will return to it again yeah. so here Paul is just simply saying listen how can we take care of these physical problems when you're so divided you don't even have anybody that could judge whether that's right or wrong mm -hmm. he said your biggest problem is you need to be of one mind and one judgment yes. okay that's number one many of the people in the Corinthian church had been converted under Paul's ministry four or five years earlier when he had first planted the Corinthian church and so there's an earlier segment on the church at Corinth. It's in the introduction. Number two, Paul pleads with his children in the Lord. Notice he does not rebuke them sharply. He said, now I beseech, beseech you. He Lord. said, listen, I'm begging you. Why don't you get together, solve your differences? I'm begging you. Be of one mind and one judgment. Before he ever addresses, addresses the physical sins, he said, I'm begging you. 
Your your biggest problem is be, you, I'm beseech. B e s e e c h. Trust the Lord. Yeah. Yep. I see. Thank you, Lord. And so he doesn't rebuke them. He is just pleading with them. You need to take care of this inner problem, this heart problem, and then we'll address the fleshly problems later. I beseech you, Parakalo. It is from the same, uh, okay, number two, Paul pleads with his children in the Lord. Notice he does not rebuke them sharply. Now I beseech you, brethren. What's Parakalo? Parakalo is from the same word as Parakletos. And Parakletos is the paraclete or comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. Yeah. When, uh, when the scripture says, Jesus said, I'll go away and the comforter will come. Mm -hmm. Parakletos. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit will come. Oh. And it means the one who will stand alongside of you. Okay. Like your lawyer in an arraignment. Yeah. yeah. And your lawyer in the trial. And the lawmaker. Yeah, and the lawyer that goes all the way through it. Right. Like in this case... He illuminates the mind, yes. But in this case, he's the one that stands alongside of you and pleads your case. You go up before God, and Jesus will say, I paid for all of Robert's sins. And God says, oh, well, then there's no arraignment. He's your advocate. Advocate, yep. There's no arraignment. Jesus is the one that here is called the paracletos, the paraclete. I beseech you, he said, I'm doing this, not someone to rebuke you, but someone that wants to stand alongside and help defend you. Yeah, so Jesus be like our attorney. He's our attorney. Before we go before the judge. Yep. And here, okay. Paul is saying yep. that he's doing the same thing. He says, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here like your lawyer mm. to help defend you and lead you through this whole process. One that okay. doesn't get paid off. Uh, well, that's that actually started in Chicago. Yeah, it's called a mouthpiece. Yeah, it was invented by the Chicago mm -hmm. crooks. You go out and hire a mouthpiece. Yeah. Well, this is not that. This is talking about the real deal. No, I know. Yeah. Okay. So uh, mm -hmm. the meaning is that Paul is coming as the Holy Spirit comes, as a teacher, guiding them, exhorting them, and begging them as he tries to bring them out of their error. Rather than sharp rebuke, he, excuse me, he reminds them that they are his Christian brothers in the Lord. He calls them brethren. Three, he then reminds them that their Savior, Jesus Christ, is the channel through which all exhortation and learning must take place. And so let's read that again in... Uh, verse 10. Yeah, let's read verse 10 again. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, by the name of our, in the textbook, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you do these things. That's the blank. That's the two blanks. How about Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord. Jesu Christo. That's what it is in the Greek. See, in Spanish... It's not a translation, it's a transliteration. Yeah. Jesu Christo is from the Greek, which is Jesu Christos. Yeah. Diama. Huh? Diama. Diama? Yeah. And so uh, uh, he reminds them that their Savior, Jesus Christ, is the channel through which all exhortation and learning must take place. A, Christ is the authority for biblical exhortation. B, he is the channel through which change can come. C, he is the channel through whom we receive the grace of God, both to be saved and to learn how to live godly lives and to stand firm in the truth. Uh, do you have that, Daniel, Romans 5.2? Yes. Rome, well, I was asking if he's got it handy there to read it to us. Oh, yeah, you have the right Bible Yep. By, two. by whom also we have access by faith mm. into, into this grace wherein we stand so, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All right. So by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. So Christ is the channel for God's grace to get saved. He's also the channel for God's grace to help us live. So Godly by whom? Uh, yes, it was by whom, 
if I remember right, Daniel? Yes. Yeah. By, by whom also we have access by faith. Or, or B Y. No, not it's, in, it's in whom. In, in whom. oh, in whom. Thank in you. Whom. In whom also we have access by faith. In whom? Yes. Yeah. In whom? In whom? W H O M. No E. W H O M. Number four. Back in the textbook. A plea for the church to be of one voice, one mind, one judgment. And that's again verse 10. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And fill in the blanks at home if you don't have them already. So what he's saying is present a present a united front to the world. B present a united front a front against sin to prevent it from infiltrating the church. And C present it a united front against heresy. Because he's going to address all of those problems later. But he said you need to present a united front. And then we can address those problems. Five, the church did not even know that unity was its greatest need. Verse 11, for it hath been declared unto me of you. So the letter they wrote to him didn't even address the problem. In fact, probably, it's my opinion, that since they were divided into four groups, I bet only one of the groups sent him a letter. Yeah. Only one group, I mean. It was probably one group that said, hey, there's not there's a problem here. We got this guy shacked up with a stepmom. We've got all these other problems. We need, I'm of Paul, right? One, you'll find out later. They said, well, I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas, which is Peter. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Christ. Probably the, the group, the division there that said, I'm of Paul, probably said, we need to write a letter to Paul so he can straighten all those other groups out. Hmm. Because it's their groups that have all this sexual immorality and all these problems. Lord help I, them. Yeah, Lord help them to straighten out. And then they'll all join us. No. So we don't know who wrote it. But we do know that that letter didn't address the problem of divisions. He said in verse 11, For it hath been declared unto me of you. Someone else told him this. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So it wasn't any of the groups in Corinth that wrote a letter and said, we got this problem of we're all split into church politics. We've got this click over here and that click over there and this one over here. I had someone just tell me just about a month ago, I don't want to get involved in the politics, the church politics. And it wasn't in this church, it was in another church. They said, I don't want to get involved in the church politics. Well, that's exactly what was going on here at Corinth. Four different groups. Okay? So, um, they didn't even know that unity was its greatest need. A, they had written a letter to Paul about some problems in the church. That's later in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. B, but Paul's knowledge of this problem of division did not come from that letter. It came from the house of Chloe, a member of the church at Corinth. Mm. So it wasn't the, one of the four groups. It was a member. There was somebody there had enough spiritual sense to say, we in trouble. Paul is our daddy in the Lord. He's the one that led a bunch of us to the Lord and started this church. Why don't we go to him and see if we can get this problem of the church being split into four factions why don't, we, why don't we contact our daddy in the Lord, Brother Paul? And so she contacted him. What is the church at, Cor at Corinth? It was a church at Corinth. Corinth was the capital of the Corinthian church. Uh, the Corinthian, the book of Corinthians was written to the church at Corinth. Okay. Just like the book of Ephesians was written to the, book, to the church at Ephesus. Colossians was written to the church at Colossae. Okay. okay. Romans was written to the churches at Rome because by the time Paul wrote to them, that church had already split into several different churches and later became the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So they had written a letter to Paul about some problems in the church, but Paul's knowledge of this problem of division did not come from that letter. 
It came from the house of Chloe, a member of the church at Corinth. Chloe was a woman of some standing in the Corinthian church. Some of her house were probably at Athens on business. She was a businesswoman. Some of her house were probably at Athens on business and told Paul about the growing division at Corinth. Possibly, they were the three mentioned, three men mentioned in chapter 16, verse 17. We're not going to go there for time because we'll get there later. I'm on page 8 now. Okay. Now we've got Christian partisanship. Four groups, Christian parties, if you will, in verse 12. Verse 12 says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So he said, you've got this church politics going on to the point of you're saying, I'm a Paul. Uh, but the inference is, if you're not a Paul, you're wrong. Like you said, Lord, straighten them out. That's why when someone hurts me, I pray this way. And I'm still praying this way for several people. God, do whatever you have to do in their life and mine to make us both better servants. Right. Instead of, go get them. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yeah. I'm not trying to restore that person. I'm not wishing God's praying for God to bless them. Sick him, Lord. Yeah, go sick him, Lord. <laughs> Actually, David did that a few times. Okay. It's called the, in the Psalms. There are some of the Psalms that are called imprecatory Psalms. Okay. And the imprecatory Psalms, is God bring their own evil back upon their own pate. Okay. Break their cheekbone break their teeth in their mouth. There were times when David got so angry that he was saying, God, go. you ever try to fight with a broken cheekbone? I studied martial arts for about 40 years. And you know what happens when a, when a fighter gets punched right there yeah. and that eye will swell shut? Yeah. Now they're trying to fight with one eyeball. Not only that, break their teeth in their mouth. If you got a broken tooth, every time you breathe, the pain will shoot straight through your head. Yeah. Because you got a broken tooth. And Paul, and Paul, David would get that way. I mean, he, he would get so down, he would say, God, bring their own, break their cheekbone, break their teeth in their mouth. Those are called the imprecatory psalms. We really shouldn't do that. No. That was Old Testament. We're under grace, which is not grace for just me. It's for grace for you too. Friend or enemy. Yes. Paul and... I am a it's in verse 12. Okay. Verse 12. You, that's why the only blanks you'll find in here are blanks in the scriptures. Oh. So that's your homework. You can fill those in. Uh, verse 12 said, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, which is Peter, and I have Christ. Oh, that's all your blanks. He just gave you all the blanks. Verse 12. Yeah, they're in verse 12. I am. The Paulican party, followers of Paul, and his preaching on Christian liberty. These were probably the ones that were most likely to twist Christian liberty in the false doctrine of Christian license to sin. Then the Apollian party, followers of Apollos, the eloquent and gifted preacher from Alexandria. They were probably the Greeks who had never quite shaken off their penchant for philosophical rhetoric. C, the Cephite party. Followers of Cephas, Peter. These were probably Jewish Christians who felt that Cephas, the leader of the Twelve, was more likely to retain some of the Jewish ceremonialism. The Cephas party would probably say, well, yeah, you know, you probably should get... Oh, hello. The uh, Cephas party would tend to go back to Judaism. And they would probably say things like, well, yeah, you got to be saved in Christ... But maybe I probably ought to go ahead and get circumcised oh. just to cover all the bases. Wow. That's probably where they would go. For the others, the Paul party that preached on grace, the guy that was shacked up with his stepmom, they said, oh, well, he's forgiven. It's no big deal. In other words, they twist grace, liberty from, from sin, not liberty to sin. They change the truth of God and pull out. Yeah, they got it twisted a little bit. And then the Cephite party was C, D, the Christian party, those who claimed to follow Christ. Some probably did truly want to follow Christ, while others simply used the name of Christ as a rallying point for those who did not want to join one of the other groups. 
Uh -huh. Number two, the falsity of Christian partisanship is verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so, back in the textbook, 2A, get your eyes off the preachers and back on Christ. Partisanship is divisive. And so your blank is Christ. Is Christ divided? All your blanks are in the scriptures. So the preacher did not die for you. Christ did. So that's the blank is, was Paul crucified for you? Again, out of verse 13. Okay, you get the idea. C, you were baptized in the name of Christ, not in the name of the preacher. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Or Terry. Yeah, or Terry. Or Daniel, or Robert, or Candy, Gretchen, Gracia, Sleepy, Dopey. <laughs> Whoever the rest of them are, you know. Right? No, Christ died for you. Paul wasn't crucified for you. Neither was any of us crucified for you. So if you're going to follow Christ, don't follow somebody that says, I'm the leader of the Christian party. And you start to follow me. No, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Yep. In other words, if I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. Okay. So... Uh, D, baptism is not the most important thing salvation is. Yes, well, thank you. And the rest of all. Thank you, sir. Those are my good friends here. Okay, so uh, D, baptism is not the most important thing salvation is, verses 14 through 17a, 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Christus and Gaius lest any should say that I, I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. And I, he says, I don't remember. I baptized a lot of people. But the people that you would know, I, I baptized a few, but not many. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to Preach the gospel. That's page eight. B two D. All right, number three. Now, divine wisdom. We're going to take about another minute and just begin on that, and then we'll pick up there next week. Next week, you're going to have the textbook up on the big screen. I couldn't do it this week. Divine wisdom, Roman numeral three, and that's verses seventeen to thirty-one. Here we will see a contrast between human wisdom and divine wisdom. Through the cross, we see the wisdom of God as he meets the greatest need of a lost humanity. A. Baptism and flowery rhetoric are not in the ascendance the gospel is. So verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And so he said, Hey, the gospel, getting saved, that's the important thing. Baptism secondary. You have to do that after you're saved. Mm. So the most important thing is not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. In other words, if I preached, you need to get baptized, and didn't preach the gospel. None effect? Yeah, that's in the scripture there. Yeah. All right? And so if I just simply came and started baptizing a bunch of people, I'd have a whole church full of lost people because I didn't preach the gospel to them. You got out of order. Baptismal regeneration. <laughs> Getting it out of order. Literally. Yep. Okay. So any questions or comments? So we're going to pick up with Roman numeral three. All right. I'm not going to make a mark in this book because it's an extra mark for the next two. All right. Roman numeral three is going to be divine wisdom. We'll pick up there next week. Well, that's, the, that's the answer. Not a fact. Yeah, it's the scripture. All of oh, your yeah, blanks, right all of your blanks are in the scripture. Yeah, I can. So do those while at home for homework. Come next week. We'll try to get through a couple of pages next week. Oh, wow. All right. We're going to try to get through a couple of pages. Any questions or comments?
No, sir. I, I got it. Okay, I just want yeah. to thank you for your faithfulness. Oh, yeah. that's yeah, that's well said. A lot said. of years, John. I we go back a lot of years. Yeah, I know. Too many. Not, not too many that way, but I mean too many to mention. Yes, sir. Yeah. I appreciate how you uh, explain things as well. I really do. Because well, thank God because well, I do you're just an old it. guitar picker. I do take it, but a lot of times people will not do that because they like, well, we got to do this work. Yeah. You know, so I That's appreciate all right. that. Well, amen. I appreciate you guys being here. Otherwise, I'd be talking. Well, I'd still be talking to one or two out on the internet out there. Any, uh, in just a minute. Don't do that with the book yet. We're <laughs> just a minute. Uh, oh, okay. If it's Corinth, you can show her where that is. Oh, thank you, sir. Yep. She said thank you. All right. Right here. Right here is Corinth. Right here is it's on the little, it's on that little isthmus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, because I want to go home and look at my book. <laughs> yeah. I got the book, a map, a book of maps or not. Uh, there's actually a map in this textbook that shows you right where Corinth yeah, is. Yep. There's not good enough for me. I got a map. Yep. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and dismiss in prayer. And uh, we'll be back next Monday. Sister Candy, would you dismiss us in prayer? Monday. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've given us tonight. Yes. The knowledge that you have given us through this. I thank you for each for us, Lord Jesus. Brother Brown, we thank you for this yes. family. God, just give us lots of wisdom in these classes. Yes, Lord. Things that I didn't understand that already opened in my eyes. Yes. I'm sure other people. Lord Jesus, thank you again for all the blessings, all that we've gone through, even the things that are bad, Lord Jesus, we know why. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord, and be with us and take us home safe, be with this building as we leave it. It's yours first. Thank you so much for everything. In your holy, precious name, amen. 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 All right, we shall see you all for church tomorrow night, right? Lord willing. Lord willing. Let me get us off.